Good morning. Thank you for joining us today on a Sunday morning and a special word of appreciation to the AAMC for its sponsorship, which allows us to record these workshops and makes this content available to every corner of the world. My name is Savneet Takar, and I'm a pre-medical programming coordinator for this year's 12th Annual Pre-Medical and Pre-Health Professions National Conference. I have the honor of introducing our second keynote speaker today. She is a trailblazer for women, a pioneer for those underrepresented in medicine, and as an aspiring female medical educator, someone I admire. It is my honor to introduce to you our second keynote speaker, Dr. Barbara Ross Lee. Dr. Ross Lee earned her doctorate of osteopathic medicine from the Michigan State University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. And currently, she is the Vice President of Health Sciences and Medical Affairs for the New York Institute of Technology. She is a nationally recognized expert of health policy issues, primary care, medical education, and health care issues affecting minorities, women, and rural populations. She previously served as commissioned officer and achieved the rank of captain in the U.S. Naval Reserve's Medical Corps. Moreover, she is known as a history maker for overcoming the social adversaries placed to front the, the aspiring youth of our nation in the, early, in the late 1960s. In 1993, Dr. Barbara Ross Lee was appointed as the first African American Dean of any medical institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest, Dr. Barbara Ross Lee. Good morning. Good Sunday morning. I should tell you that my grandfather was a Baptist minister, so get ready for the sermon. <laughs> All right? Actually, um, I have so much to tell you that I decided I'd better write it down or I'd be talking for the next two hours, and I, I don't think anybody wants to listen to me talk for two hours anyway. So first of all, let me say, I'd like to thank the organizers of this, the 12th Annual Pre-Medical and Pre-Health Professions Conference. It is, uh, I am pleased and extremely honored to be the keynote speaker on this occasion. And they've asked me to tell my story, but you know, my story, while unique to me, is not that distinctive in the scope of life stories. Because, because if there's one thing that I've learned in my short lifetime, the emphasis is on the short, short lifetime, it is that everyone has a story. Everyone has a story of success and failure, hardship and opportunity. Whenever I speak, though, I try to establish some objectives for myself. So I have four objectives today. First, I want to be informative so that you will maybe give you something that you didn't know before I started talking. Second, I want to be a little bit provocative so that you'll remember that I was here today. And third, I want to be engaging, so hopefully I will stimulate some questions because it's with that question, that engagement process, that not only do I try to teach you something, but you also teach me something in the process. And finally, I hope to be a little entertaining. I will consider my presentation a success if I achieve at least three of the four, so if you're not entertained, I'm still good, okay? <laughs> The title of my presentation is Essential Perspectives to the Future of Healthcare. So I will start by telling you my story, who I am, where I came from, so that you can share my perspective because my perspective determines how I see the world, the questions I ask, the things I want, and the issues that are important to me. Your perspective is formed, as is mine, by your experiences, your choices, your opportunities, your heritage, and your education. Not surprisingly, my perspective forms my dedication and commitment to what I have chosen to do as a professional career, and that's healthcare. I grew up at a different time and in a different place 
from where we are today. As we become more mature, and I use that as a euphemism for uh, aging, we often reflect on the challenges and opportunities that we had, challenges and opportunities that may be different from the youth of today. Although we think, and I certainly do, and although my children correct me daily, although we think of our childhood as, as being more difficult, in reality, they weren't. They were just filled with different challenges, with changed societal opportunities and cultural expectations, with different economic and educational barriers. There's a fundamental similarity between the generations, however, and it's unrelated to the circumstances of birth and the socioeconomic and sociocultural consequences of being born a minority and or poor in American society. The similarity is related to our ability to dream, even the impossible dreams. In my lifetime, I have been African American, Afro American, black, a person of color, Negro, and even Negra. I have, and not surprisingly, always been female. <laughs> not surprised, huh? Although it was often confused with sugar, sweetie, honey. I received a part of my grade school education in the segregated South, an experience nobody should have to repeat. I'm the oldest of six children and the only one to receive a college degree. By any measure, by any measure, I was poor until I was 21 years of age. Without hope and opportunity, poverty is a life sentence of despair and lost dreams. I had a dream that I would become a physician and I would make a difference for the health vulnerable populations of this country. The civil rights movement in the 60s made my dream possible. I was also influenced by my family and personal health history. I lost my firstborn child from congenital heart defect as a result of rubella, German measles. My youngest child was born prematurely and weighed two pounds at birth. And my mother died from breast cancer, diagnosed too late. I had no access to educational scholarships or loans, so I worked my way through college and medical school. I have worked at the U.S. Post Office by the way, I know what they mean when they say going postal. <laughs> I've worked as a dance instructor, as a receptionist, as a typist, as a medical laboratory technician, as a middle school teacher, as a biochemist, and as a microbiologist. After medical school, I even served, as you heard earlier, as a um, member of the U.S. Navy Medical Corps, achieving the rank of captain. I am an osteopathic family physician. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's now time to find out. Osteopathic medicine is the fastest growing health profession in the country. I began my medical school as a divorced mother of two. My son was three years old and my daughter was a year old. I practiced medicine for 10 years in the city of Detroit before joining academia as the chair of the Department of Family Medicine. And I made that transition because I believed that academia was where I could have an impact and make things better for those patients that I was treating in the inner city of Detroit. I left Michigan State University uh, to become uh, the, a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow 
And when I returned to uh, MSU, I, I became the Associate Dean for Health Policy. And after that, I left and became the Dean of Ohio University's College of Osteopathic Medicine. And you need to know, um, I didn't know that I was the first black female dean until after I accepted the position. And actually, it was the Association of Family Practitioners that caught on to that. After leaving Ohio University, after uh, eight years as dean, I joined New York Institute of Technology. And at NYIT, I've served as the dean of the School of Health Professions, as well as the College of Osteopathic Medicine. Today, I just wear one hat. That's Vice President for Health Sciences and Medical Affairs at New York Institute of Technology. The practice of medicine is not just what I do. It is an immutable part of who I am, like my race and gender. And that will be true for each of you as you enter the health professions. It is how I think of myself and how others think of me. But most people don't know what a dean does, by the way. They certainly don't know what a vice president of the health sciences does. But everybody knows what doctors do. My mentors were the women in my family who guided me and demonstrated the importance of personal sacrifice, hard work, perseverance, and unconditional love. Never never underestimate the power of family support and mentorship. My role models were drawn from books because there were no black female physician role models that I could identify as I was aspiring to medicine. And the role models that I chose were Joan of Arc, because she was such an unlikely leader and Albert Einstein for his ability to think out of the box. My proudest accomplishments are my five children and eight grandchildren. My oldest son is an engineer. My second oldest is a social worker. My daughter is ob um, My youngest son is a medical device salesman. And my daughter is a voting rights attorney. I could have populated many more professions. I just didn't want to have any more kids. <laughs> Every day, I am reminded of who I am and where I come from. Those reminders serve to keep me focused on what is important. I am motivated by the generations of minorities, women and men, that must follow after me. That's enough about me. Now I want to talk about each of you. You didn't know I knew you, huh? The poor standing of minority and economically disadvantaged Americans in the indices of good health is a scandal. And it's a scandal of such long standing that it has lost the ability to shock the nation. Clearly, we need more perspectives focused on the problems of health disparities. For that, I turn to Einstein. Einstein's theory of relativity is based on the premise that viewing an event from different positions results in seeing the event differently. The corollary to this is that by analyzing the different views, the event can be more accurately defined. I'd like to carry that theory even a little bit further, probably further than Einstein ever intended. And that is, what an individual sees depends on his or her perspective, which infers that each person's perspective is important and valuable in defining the event. Even in this age 
of a rapidly growing biomedical knowledge base, scientific excellence and medical achievements are limited by limiting the perspectives which contribute to the, in the discovery process. Thus, involving minorities and economically disadvantaged students in science and health careers is important to science, important to science, and to population health, not as an affirmative action or equity strategy, but because you bring a unique perspective which could benefit all by helping to more accurately define, according to Einstein, events. Healthcare addresses questions of what, where, when, why, and how. The who is addressed by the opportunities available in social and institutional environments which nurture and support the future generations of the health workforce. In this society, where majorities are judged on the perceived strengths and minorities and women are judged on their perceived weaknesses, it is not surprising that abilities are often confused with opportunity and choice. To quote Jocelyn Elders, she's the former U.S. Surgeon General, and I quote, some things seem highly unlikely, even impossible, but I have, learned, I have learned the important life lesson that nothing is impossible. Knowledge through education is a wondrous gift, but knowledge seen through the filters of scholarship, reason, experience, and tradition develops wisdom and expand science, end of quote. It is my theory of relativity that the inclusion of more diverse perspectives represented by minorities and economically disadvantaged health and medical professional students will, will expand the science of health to achieve health parity for all Americans. Each of you has that potential. Most of the formula you already have, just by being you, with a distinctive perspective, take advantage of opportunities, the brass ring. Your success is our success. By the year 2030, it is projected that today's underrepresented minorities will be nearly 50% of the U.S. population. Thus, providing opportunities for success is in all of our best interest. There's, there are no quick fixes, no silver bullets, no magic wand for creating and sustaining opportunities for our youth, for our future healthcare workforce. For the students here today, much is expected of you. We are all acutely aware that you have the ability to be successful. Your challenges will be related to the judgment that you use and how you handle your life issues, because life won't leave you alone just because you are following your dreams. And using the opportunities for success available to you. In closing, let me share with you some lessons that I have learned in my quest to make a difference. And I, I collect these lessons all the time. I have about 50 of them but you'll be pleased to know I only have about 14 that I want to share with you today. How's that? 
First lesson, being qualified is a measure of opportunity, not worth. Second lesson, majorities are judged on their perceived strengths, while minorities are judged on their perceived weaknesses. Third lesson, and I repeat this to my students all the time, know the rules. That's your responsibility. Know the rules. Fourth, new strategies are required to solve old problems. Fifth, don't be predictable. Predictability is based on preconceived bias. Don't be predictable. Six, entitlement is a myth. You're not entitled to anything. You're going to have to earn it. Seven. I used to tell my daughter the OBGYN this all the time as she complained, so I share it with you. Nobody promised you fair. Eight. No one succeeds alone. Nine. Everyone Everyone has an important story to tell. 10, be your own worst critic. Be honest with yourself. Take responsibility for your decisions. 11, keep your eyes on the prize. Stay focused. 12, achieving dreams takes hard work, preparation, and opportunity. Thirteen, do unto others, you all know it, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Practice the golden rule. And finally, making a difference is not about what's in it for you, but what's in it for others. So let me close with one final quote. And this quote is from an unknown author, and I think it's something that is important for all of you as you finish your time at this conference. And that is, and I quote, your present circumstances don't determine where you can go. They merely determine where you start. Thank you very much. <laughs>